Hey everyone, Erin from The Impatient Gardener and welcome to my circle garden. If you've been following me for any amount of time, you know that the main thing to know about the circle garden is that it is not a circle. It is an oval, but I call it the circle garden because it has a way better ring than the oval garden. In any case, this is a garden that I created and it's gone through many iterations, but I created this many, many years ago. And this was the home of a small vegetable patch when we bought this house and it had all gone to weeds and there was some Rosa Sharon in there, but it was mostly, it was mostly weeds. And I wanted a little uh, area of formality here and its latest iteration was maybe five years ago or so. And um, then I put in straight paths and sort of segmented this garden. And then I also added in my chive hedge. I've talked about the chive hedge before. I have a whole video on the chive hedge. The chive hedge is quirky, but I love it. The chive hedge is also not a problem. So watch the chive hedge video if you're worried about chives gone rogue, because they don't do that. So one of my favorite ways to work in spring is to concentrate on one area and get it pretty much finished. But that is, rarely an opportunity that I have because let's be honest if I focus just on one area everything else could go to hell in a handbasket real quick but I am going to focus on sprucing up the circle garden because we're going in a little bit of a different direction this year so I already did my sort of annual maintenance of the chive hedge uh, probably almost a month and a half ago or more uh, and that basically requires weeding out the grass that gets into the chives which requires actually lifting the chives picking out the grass because it all looks the same at that point and then dividing them where needed because sometimes we lose little patches here and there and need to fill in areas uh, and then just putting them back again it's actually a job that i really enjoy doing it's a sort of um, mindless task that is really nice to just dig into so i usually do that early in the year but when I first imagined this iteration of the Triangle Garden, I had divided each area into segments. So we have four areas that lead to the middle and there is a boxwood in a container in the center of each. And my idea was that I would draw a virtual triangle between all those. And then each segment would be divided into three based on that diamond. Now that kind of worked, but the side areas are really quite small and they didn't often work great. And uh, I wanted to go a little bit, I don't know if we're actually doing any less maintenance on this now, but I'm changing things up because in one segment on the uh, south side of the, no, the north side of this, so the big change for this year is that I've ditched the roses. So uh, in the three segments that I will be keeping three segments on the two large ends, um, I have rhubarb growing in one. I like rhubarb. I think rhubarb is a beautiful plant and I love those big leaves. Plus I like to eat rhubarb. Uh, and then I had uh, David Austin Onwick roses in the other segment. And then I always left the front part of that available for, an for some annual color. The roses have hit, hit, hit the road. They have been rehomed, and uh, because they just never performed. When they did perform, it was basically one big flush of blooms. I didn't get a lot of reblooming on them, uh, and you know they were hit by softfly larvae and Japanese beetles and all these things. And I just I I was over that. So I will show you what we're replacing. That we're going we're going to stick with the shrubs, but we're going a different direction. And then also on the south end over here, I have been growing bobo hydrangeas there for many years. Those are great, but I decided to add in an additional shrub uh, rather than two segments of annuals there. So I'll show you the shrub that's going there. As for the two little skinny ones, those are going to be mass planted with just one thing. So likely on this side, I will just do a mass planting of the same dahlia or two different varieties of dahlias and on the other side i'm not sure what i'm going to do over there i think i might just do seed grown annuals there like a whole bunch of cosmos and zinnias taller zinnias on that side but there's ladies mantle growing there now so we're going to have to rehome that so let me walk you around and i'll show you what we're planting where in the center of this garden i grow multiple clematis over the years, some have come and some have gone. I don't exactly know what's still here. I don't actually know how many are here. I see one, two, three for sure. One of them is this one, Viticella uh, purpurea, Plana elegans. That was a gift from Yulia. Um, so that's one of them. 
I'm not sure what everything else is. So a bit of a bit of a mystery here, but I always grow them up this trellis. Um, and this trellis was actually like a half DIY, half bought thing. I did a blog post on how I made it and I will link that uh, below in the description for you if you are curious about that. Now over here we have our first new addition to the garden. These came from Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs and this is Itea Fizzy Mizzy. This is a small uh, uh, sweet spire and uh, which can handle a little bit of shade and this corner in particular gets a little bit more shade um, and the west side of this garden gets a little bit of shade too but for the most part this one is probably like and that, it's not like a lot but it's like probably just enough to push this under a full sun category over here so i think these will do well here they should get uh two to three feet tall and wide uh, beautiful flowers on them my go i hope they match okay with the bobos the bobos you know just get covered in flowers then in front of this there is a triangle in the front of this where we will put some annuals i don't know what those will be yet maybe some coleus we'll see what happens there okay moving around to this segment here we've got ladies mantle this is what i've been growing here for many years we're gonna dig that out and rehome that one of my favorite plants i always have a use for it in the garden I'll just do a little bit of weeding, say for instance of giant dandelions uh, in this area and nothing will happen here until annuals can be grown. In this corner, we've got all the rhubarb. This rhubarb all came from my grandmother's house and her rhubarb came from either her parents or her grandparents' house. So these rhubarb plants are probably from uh, before 1900. Uh, the front of this is going to get a really fun annual treatment and back here we have um, a very interesting shrub and I know it looks like two different varieties of shrubs but let me explain what's happening here. So for this area I really wanted something that would look good all year and that's because that's what I was lacking with the roses. So um, for me that often means you start thinking about foliage more than flowers and you can probably recognize what kind of plant this is because this one happens to be flowering but honestly the flowers have nothing to do with why I'm growing it. This is a new Wygela from Proven Winners it's called Midnight Sun. It only gets about a foot to 18 inches tall and wide it's a tiny little thing but what you're going for here are these um, leaves which will get a variety of colors from orange to red to green to to sort of this kind of burgundy purpley color uh, throughout the summer depending on how much sun they have and what type of part of the season it is and I thought that would be a really interesting contrast because keep in mind I'm gonna do something wild and crazy with the annuals in this area so something just kind of um, interesting not boring but interesting and looks good all year I thought would be great so Prover Winter sent me six of these and then I realized with at only 12 to 18 inches, if I mass plant in this area, I really needed more. So I went to a local nursery and I ordered three Midnight Suns and this is what I got. But I think, we think, these are actually the same plant, even though these look very, very different. Now I have reached out to Proven Winners and they think, I mean, we're going to keep in touch on this, but they think we're probably okay here. And that the situation is, that we have here is that this one might have been grown. Like, first of all, I think this one is much far behind in growth because the leaves are much smaller. Um, although it is, it is starting to put up flowers. I don't know. Um, but that maybe it was grown in more shade or something, or maybe who knows because of different growing conditions, these are two different things, but, we have enough confidence that I'm going to plant them. There's th there's only three additional ones that I had to buy. They look ridiculous right now mixed in here, but, and I will pull them out and plant them somewhere else if they turn out to be the wrong thing. But theoretically, these two are the same plant. What do you think?
to take a stroll And to me that's all right To me that's all right ah. Okay, so shrubs are in. Uh, this soil is in really good shape. It's been got a lot of organic matter worked in it over the years, as well as biochar. And the only thing I do when I'm planting trees and shrubs these days is add in um, some of these organic mechanics, forget about it, root zone feeder packs. These are these little sachets, like a little tea bag kind of. And this has uh, mycorrhiza, soil reef, biochar, azomite, and oyster shell flower. 100% organic. It's a 422 is the um, breakdown on it. So that's the only thing, if you saw me throwing those in there, that's what that was. Now I did mention that we're going to plant some annuals in there. And that's one of the things that I like about these Midnight Sun Wygela because I think they look really cool, at least for a couple of years until they totally fill in and maybe even after that with some annuals sort of popping through them. And what better than... Um, Good old Gara. So I picked a white one for this. I didn't think the pink would work because the leaves tend to get pretty orange in some cases, at least according to the pictures. So we're going with a white Gara. This one happens to be Belize white. Uh, it's honestly, it's the it's the one that I found. Uh, and it's a shorter growing one. It's uh, 12 to 18 inches. So Gara is pretty hardy. So I'm going to, not hardy enough to overwinter here, by the way, at least not that I've experienced. Uh, so I actually think that this scar will be just fine outside right now, even if some of the other annuals are not ready to go out. So I'm actually going to space these amongst the uh, shrubs and get these in right now too. I'm telling you, the sky is blue, the sun is high. I'm sitting here on my own. I think of you, you're on my the next quick job is just to dig up this lady's mantle so I can go transplant that elsewhere in the garden. Anytime I dig up a uh, plant to transport it, I always check it for riders, weeds that might be coming along with it. So I don't just move weeds around my garden. So here's a clump that I just dug up. We've got a maple seedling here. Uh, and then we've got some grass in there and I thought I saw some oh there's a little bit of creeping Charlie in there so I just give everything a super quick once over just to make sure that I'm not like compounding my weed problems elsewhere in the garden and that looks pretty clean to me that's all right green grass on my neighbor's lawn maybe I should take a straw so just want to show you something quick. First of all, I accidentally dug up a few chives. No big deal, these are so easy. I will just pop them right back in the ground. But I looked right here and this is creeping bellflower, which I've done a wide and weeds on before, but it is my most hated weed. It is horrifically invasive. So as long as I'm seeing it here, I'm going to, cause it will take over quickly. I'm gonna just lift this whole group of chives here and I'm going to pick it all out individually out of this group of chives and then that goes in the garbage can not the compost pile or anywhere else because it will just grow wherever you put it now this spreads from big deep carrot like rhizomes so it's unlikely that we'll, well here we can see some of those here I mean, this is just a baby, but you can see the rhizome on that plant. And that spreads underground like two feet. So there's probably more where that came from, but at least I can get these out. And this is basically what I do in spring when I clean out the chive hedge. I just, if needed, I lift the clump of hot chives. I um, weed them out and then I plunk them back in and it, and then I give them a little water, and that is it. Now the next job in here is a little bit of boxwood maintenance. Now these boxwoods, and I believe they're all green velvets, have been growing in these pots for 
think this is the third year or we might be in the fourth year now. Anyways, they've been in here for a little bit. I believe I've replaced one or two of them over that time. There's one that's a little smaller than the other. So I think that's the one I replaced. But I want to show you sort of this routine maintenance, first time I've done this that we're gonna do here. And then I'm also leveling these pots because as I said, pots and gardens must be level in my brain. Okay, so the first step is to just slide them out of these pots. So first off, I'm very happy to see roots here. Um, you might recall that I grew a boxwood in a pot by the garage once and it wasn't doing very well and I pulled it out and it was four or five years later, the roots were still the same size as the pot I had put in there. So the first thing I'm gonna do here is I'm just kind of scraping off the loose soil on top. There's some you know, boxwood leaves that are on there and stuff and um, you know, just soil that has kind of built up over the years from putting mulch in there. Now, these sink in the pots. Um, as they grow, that soil compresses, and because there's organic matter in there, that just gets used up. So I'm gonna put a little bit of soil in the bottom of the pot, but the first thing I do is level the pot while it's empty. So I just use three bricks as um, levelers, and um, because these have sort of sunk a little bit, I'll just kind of bring them up just a touch. And you can't really see these once the pot's on them, and you certainly can't see it once there's other stuff growing here. The other thing about those is that it raises the drainage hole. So that drainage hole in there um, has a couple inches below it so water can easily drain out of it rather than going straight into the ground. This one was the most out of level of all of them. So I've been using my 58 ounce ice cream scoop, Amazon, like 12 bucks, or at least when I bought it, um, and filling this up. I put in about one scoop, maybe one and a half scoops of the Organics Mechanics um, compost planting. Uh, it's not straight compost, it's got other stuff in it, including soil. And then we're also gonna put in a scoop of biochar. Mix in about that much of the biochar blend. So that gives this some um, fresh soil to work with, as well as raises that level a little bit. So now there's sort of you know, little edges that you have to fill in. So I just sort of slide some of that compost planting bun in there and just kind of work it down with my fingers. And then the last step is a little bit of fertilizer. This is the Top Buxus Boxwood Fertilizer. Uh, it's a granular and you just kind of sprinkle it around the top. Um, I've been using these Top Buxus products since I got boxwood blight in some boxwoods on the property. So I use two products from them. I use this granular fertilizer and this is like a fertilize, let's see what it says. Three times per, se per season, preferably mid-April, mid-June, and mid-August. So I'm off by a month, but honestly, that's probably fine for my climate. And then the other thing I use is a, um, another spray-on product um, that I spray everything with, and that's a once-a-month deal. So um, there's that. I will water these in, and then they will look so much nicer once I prune them. I don't prune boxwoods until for at least another two or three weeks. I like to wait until they've run through their like big flush of growth and then prune them. Um, otherwise you feel like you have to go back and prune them again. So they look a little, a little shaggy and a little raggedy uh, for a little bit. But, um, and then I probably only water these pots maybe every two weeks. Uh, they really don't seem to need that much water. And uh, everything, and actually that soil was fairly moist in there. So I will give them a good drink today to work this fertilizer in, but then they're good for a little bit here. I would use the same method of refreshing a shrub in a pot 
uh, for any shrub that I was growing in a pot. Um, I would also, you know, if the shrub, if there's a lot of roots there, but you want to keep it in the same pot, you kind of have to root prune. And then you usually take off um, an equal amount on the, cro on the top of the plant too. And so root pruning, you just kind of cut some roots along the edges off so that you can get some fresh soil along the sides of them and keep them in that same pot. I just want to give you a quick view of flame weeding. This gravel path is the perfect example of where a flame weeder comes really in handy. I'm gonna be doing a whole video on flame weeding because it is one of my favorite ways to weed in areas where it's appropriate. But the key point here is that we're not incinerating weeds, we are essentially desiccating weeds. So what you wanna do is hit them with enough heat that the leaves turn sort of bright green and then it wilts and then stop. Um, because what that will do is, the way this works is that it forces the plant to try to correct that. The plant's been damaged. It sends all its energy into trying to you know, fix that and create new growth. And ideally, it burns itself out of energy. Like I said, we'll talk about the, the, the way flame weeders work and the best ways to use them in another video. But that's kind of the little tip here. Now, all those weeds are going to look green for now, that will, over the course of time, we won't see those. But we're especially not going to see them because I'm actually going to top up the gravel now. Um, because I don't know, gravel just has a way of going away. I don't know where it goes, it just disappears. So whenever I buy gravel for a project, I always try to buy a little bit of extra so that I have some spare to top things up. It also helps that I try to use the same gravel in different places so that I don't have to have like stores of multiple kinds of gravel around. A quick note about the gravel that I've used in this garden and elsewhere where I've used gravel is um, that this is all uh, stone chips basically. So they have angles on them. A few iterations of this garden ago, I used pea gravel and I hated it. Pea gravel is round. And so it never locks together. It just, it's always loose. So when you walk on it, it's like, impo it moves. So first of all, it's like, it slides under your feet. But second of all, it's extremely hard to walk on. It's like walking through really deep sand. It's not comfortable at all. So the stone chips that have angles on them, those kind of lock together. So this is what I'm talking about, how they all have you know, faces on them. They're, they're, you know, hard angles on here. This particular stone is one called Raven Black, but it's almost not, there's almost no point in telling people what the stone is called because stone is very regional. And that's for good reason, because especially with stone, the closer it is sourced to you, the better off it is because uh, the cost and the carbon footprint of shipping stone across, you know, vast parts of the country is a little ridiculous. So anyway, that's what I use for everything. I just like this kind of charcoal gray color. Um, but just find something that you like near you and it probably won't be the same thing that I have. So the last step is just spreading more gravel. I have taken a leaf blower and just blown out the path just to get any, you know, leaves or pine needles or any sort of debris that's just laying there out of there. What you want to do here is not create an area where things will break down and become soil so that you don't have weeds growing in your paths. A quick note about this path, I did this path the same way I do my other gravel areas, which is not with landscape fabric. Um, I did it with landscape fabric the first time, and I will never, ever, ever do that again. So my experience with landscape fabric has been that what happens is material breaks down on top of it, washes down to the landscape fabric, weeds then root on top of the landscape fabric, and then weeds have plants have very strong roots and they root through the landscape fabric. So you can't weed anymore. And when you decide you don't want this anymore, heaven help you. It's impossible to get up when there's material on top of it. So I am not a fan of landscape fabric in any application at all, including these gravel paths. I just do a compacted base of um, like road base, basically. Here, uh, we often use limestone screenings because that's what we have here. I think, again, this is a very regional thing.
Oh, by the way, you might have noticed me wearing several outfits during this. I actually did this over the course of four days. The actual time it took me to do this is probably an hour and a half. Um, but finding an hour and a half of uninterrupted time, and especially it was a busy weekend with Mother's Day and everything. So finding that chunk of time is almost impossible for me. I feel like I could get so much done in this garden if I had eight hours of uninterrupted time to do nothing but gardening, but that doesn't happen. So I just cranked this out and little bits and pieces here and there over the course of four days, hence many different looks. I can't tell you how nice it feels to have one part of the garden ready to go. I love projects like this where you can see everything you've accomplished and it just looks great. And even when the rest of the garden is looking a little scruffy, you have one area at least to look at. And a couple of notes here. One, uh, I use the wood chip mulch. This is just the um, wood chips from the trees that were taken down. Listen, this mulch is, in my opinion, um, if you're not gonna use compost, if you're looking for a wood product, is the best type of mulch for your plants. Uh, but beyond that, it's free. The negative side to that is that it's not particularly attractive. So, you know, is this gonna look great when I put the drone up for you? Uh, no, it is not because it's really bright. It does fade rather quickly, but more than that, it breaks down incredibly quickly. When I was pulling this mulch out of the pile, the center of that pile, that, that pile of wood chips has only been sitting there for a month. The center of that pile was already hot and starting to break down into unrecognizable wood pieces. So this is a great amendment for the garden, which is one of the reasons I use this, but let's be honest, it's also because I have a huge pile of it and it's free and I like both of those things. The garden is ready to go. The last thing to do is to add in the annuals. And the only thing I will do before I add in the annuals is I will mix in some organic fertilizer into the soil. I try to only use organic fertilizers when I'm planting in the ground and that goes for annuals too. So I'll use something, an organic granular fertilizer, and then when it comes to fertilizing throughout the season, I will use something like a fish, a fish food or a seaweed type thing. Um, sometimes that'll be a foliar application, but I will not mix up like um, the same stuff. Like I use the Proven Winners uh, liquid soluble fertilizer in my containers. I don't do that in the ground because I, I'm building my soil and so I don't want to add in anything um, that's synthetic. Okay, so the very last thing there is to do here is to just wet down this gravel so it all matches because some was dusty and some was dirty at the bottom of the bin I had. Just going to give this a quick wet so you can take a look at it from the air. Hey, thank you for watching. What you wanna do right now is subscribe if you haven't already, because we're gonna be doing all kinds of planting here and I don't want you to miss what this looks like when it's really finished. And I really don't want you to miss what this is gonna look like in a month or two. Maybe I should take a stroll. And to me, that's all right.